I'm going to invite you in just a minute, not now, to get your Bibles out, so be prepared. This Christmas, I eventually did go shopping. I should tell you all of that. I got it all done in, in one day. And I have to tell you, not only do I not like shopping, but the most challenging shopping of my whole life is shopping by myself. It's not that I can't do this. It's that I get overwhelmed. And there's one store in particular, or a type of store in particular, that just blows me away. And I, I, don't, I have no comfort for the store. You know, the stores that have all the gadgets when you first walk in the door. The store that you thought your phone worked pretty good until you realize there's a whole line of them over there that work better than whatever you had. The store that's full of gadgets and full of things that are electronic. I was pretty impressed with myself that during the wedding on New Year's Eve, I was sitting here and I was running the remote, running the music from down here. But you see on the, on the video, every time I got it right, I'd go, woo-hoo. Uh, and, and so it's forever in their video that I'm really impressed with myself that I was able to do that. Now, Ken's laughing at me because I didn't even bother him. I sat here all though that afternoon practicing. So I don't like shopping, but gadgets. One of the gadgets we got in, <laughs> this Christmas, it's one of those, um, what do you call it, the little things that fly around in your house. Oh, you guys are the wrong audience. My kids would have told me what it is. Um, yes. was really cool until the cats got interested in it. <laughs> now what happens to my beloved long-haired cat, you know where this story is going, right? <laughs> the cat was chasing it around, and all of a sudden, it, for whatever reason, it lost power and dropped on the cat, entwined into the cat, and the cat took off and went under the Christmas tree. And it looked at me like, what did I ever do to deserve this? It's a Christmas story because what you hear is under the Christmas tree, a, this cat yowling to get out, but scared to death that this thing has been caught in its backside. And, and please... Remove this gadget with all the stories of gadgets and things that we can have. Sometimes it's hard to remember a good book. A good book, you know, one where you can touch, touch the pages. Turn pages. Hear it move as you turn the pages. Dare I say, have to get a book marker because you're going to come back to the book. Some of the famous lines starting a book. My father's favorite book was The Magnificent. And, and it's a story about a, a person who, um, let's put it this way, it starts off, I was born a remarkable child. It's a book that always caught my attention. I thought that it, actually my father just wanted to always use that quote a lot so we would look at him. And then we found out it was the beginning of the book. But it's a story of redemption and grace. Have you ever heard this one? Call me Ishmael. Comes from the book, Moby Dick. You know, some audiences, I say that and they have no idea what I'm saying because they have to see the movie. Not holding a book in their hand. Um, how about, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Do you remember that? Tale of Two Cities. How about Once Upon a Time, in a, in a city far, far away. Now the line goes like this, and most people know it this way. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Do you have a favorite book? A favorite storyline? What if your story, you as the author, started like this? In the beginning. The gospel writer, John. Let's put a little reference into who he is. The gospel writer John is not John the Baptist. It is the gospel writer John who speaks about John the Baptist. And that's why we get confused. And in fact, today, our passages that I read, I read the entire part. It's actually only scheduled to read half of that. But I think it's important that we read the entire thing. It's called the prologue. It is the first book, or the first chapter in the book of, of John, and it sets the stage for the entire gospel telling you what's ahead is important 
in the beginning. I want you to op hold a Bible in your hand, if you would, please. And if not, let your neighbor do it for you. I'd like you to turn to page one. This beloved book that we call to constantly, I'd like you to turn to page one. And when you get there, tell me. Page one, guys. Ready? Let's read it together. Let's read um, the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now I want you to turn all the way to the book of John. And that one's going to be on page 1,646. 1,646. Ready? Let's read it together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Gospel writer John has just pulled all of us, all of us, forward together in this moment in time. This word, word. When I was in seminary, I had to take this class, and the whole class was about learning how the meaning of the word meaning meant. Oh, man, I'm just not that kind of gal. I, I, you got to be a little more specific to me. I should have known I was in trouble. It was my very first seminary class, and the class was called hermeneutics. I couldn't spell it, which that was a whole other story. That was, I mean, all my insecurities came up because in the end, I was all confused. How do we know what the word is? The word is God. It is the living word of God. It's no more complex than that. Yet it is beyond our imagination, the word. Each and every time I preach, I, I say this line that came to me while I was in seminary, and it goes something like, may the words that are spoken today be the words you intend your listeners to hear, and in hearing together we share. That came to me when I was in the midst of my seminary journey, and I realized these aren't my words. I was given the privilege of speaking and talking about God's living word. Made flesh. In the culture of that time, part of the culture would have heard the gospel writer when he says, in the beginning was the word, they would have said that word, word, W-O-R-D, would have meant it gives meaning and purpose, reason to everything else you're going to hear. So that word is so important that it had its own meaning beyond just this is the word. We use the word as chair or, or carpet or flowers. Word meant something. It meant purpose, reason, thinking. Through everything else would make sense. Another part of the community at the time would use that word, the word word, and it would have meant God. And the gospel writer John pulls all of them together and says, in the beginning was God. And through all of our understanding comes God's word. We will know everything because of what God has said, God has done. I've been thinking a lot about this too. When you um, have the privilege of, of being with a young couple that is starting a new chapter in their life, it is always a joy. And a lot of times couples come and they, they're all excited and they can't even hold, hardly stay, the, stay in place for the, the actual wedding because the reception is all that's got their mind to go in. Will there be enough food? Will their time, photographs get done in time? Da, da, da. And I'm like, sit and hear God's living word now. And just so you know, on your behalf, I bring a lot of Jesus to every wedding that I do. Because I'm never confident I'll get another chance. And the couple that I've recently um, been privileged to bring together sat knowing that each and every moment was precious. And that they were creating new memories in a world that had seemed so hopeless, pulling it boldly and deeply and, and deep down 
to what was going to lie ahead. I challenged them. I challenged them that for this moment in time, God has said to them, you get to write the first page of your story. Let's turn the page. What is chapter 6 going to say? And what's the first line going to be? Wouldn't you have wished you had said, in the beginning was the word instead of, I was born a remarkable child? I would wish that if I wrote my story, that I'd be giving God all the thanks and all the glory, a lot less about me and a lot more about God. But we're on the brink of 2016. We're here, right here and now. And some of you made resolutions. You've kept all of three days. That's amazing. I have yet to start mine. Now, last night, they laughed out loud at me. I said, I'm really going to cut back on chocolate. It is possible. See, it is possible. I use the word cut back, not omit. What are you trying to, to change in your story in 2016? But what was 2015 all about? For some, it was sorrow and, and a lot of grief. Some of you have lost loved ones. But if all of 2015 was, is to be pushed aside and forgotten, we omit that God was in that story all along. For in the beginning was God, and through all things God was made. Interesting, the story continues. And John says, and became flesh. I think that's important that we understand became flesh. Something you can touch, see, feel. Smell when you put hand lotion on, you say, this is good. That was so important that God dwell with God's people, but more importantly, that we saw it to be true. And the story then became how God walks with us. The rest of the Gospel of John is really focused in on the miracles of God. Someone asked me recently, have, you know, what ever happened to the miracles? And it was a young person. What do we say to children who, you know, say to you, gosh, when's the last time God had a miracle? And I wanted to, to challenge him, but I, I, I realized he was so sincere when he said it to me. You know, when's the last time you had a miracle? Well, you're here, and I'm here. And you're breathing in and out air that you did not make. The sun is shining. You did not control it. It is setting. There were snowflakes that fell. You did not ordain that. It seems like a pretty amazing miracle that everyday living, he, he took on flesh so that he too was in our everyday living. But make no mistake, he was God through all things. I get back to 2015 to 2016. The God of flesh, the God that always dwells with us, dwelled with you in that year. And now that we are at the beginning of 2016, I'm going to promise you God dwells with you. I'm going to promise even myself God dwells with me. And if you know that right now at the beginning, how could this be a year of thankfulness? A year that even in your sorrows and joys, we say, thank you, God, for you are with us. No more trying to get over and through 2015. We're on 2016. And on our watch... 2016 could be a year of thankfulness, a year of hope and possibilities. And not one of those three or four or five, six days into the new year, but a full 12 months. 12 months where we write our story that in the beginning God was with us and we were thankful. Recently, for, well, on Christmas, um, which we just celebrated last week, actually. My kids gave me um, a collage of pictures. Now, you can't see it from there. But it really struck me. And, of course, um, I'm looking at all these pictures of last year with our kids. And I realized what they remember 
for moments of thankfulness, moments of joy. I remember moments I said farewell. I remember some challenges last year. And I remember some heartache. I remember what's behind these pictures. They remember God was with them. The smiles are not made up so that mom has a good day. The smiles were a reflection of who they were in those moments of time. And this was 2015 that builds the foundation for 2016. I can't wait to see this next Christmas and see the stories that they decided were important to share and tell. And I can't wait that I remember with thankfulness even the moments of heartache that got us to these moments of joy. I hope for you and I that this year we write a story with full awareness that God is in it and dwelling in it. These pictures, some of them are really silly. Some of these pictures, well, there's one in particular. I have my hands out like this, and my kids were teasing me. <clears throat> I do that all the time. I didn't know it. And I realized because when you do this, you have to welcome in. You can't do this and be unaware of your world. When you do this, you welcome in the sun. When you do this, you're going, yes. When you do this, you say, thank you. And in that photograph, I was saying, thank you to grandchildren, the privilege of being out for coffee, the privilege of being in God's world. The word was God, and God dwelled among God's people. What will be the words that you write in this chapter? The choices are yours. But know this, God has already chosen you. Because no matter what words you put in your journal, no matter what we, we capture in moments in time, God has already claimed us. How do we know? Because in the manger, a tiny baby was born with flesh and blood. So that we would know God. And in knowing God, we would see that God has come to take away all sin. And we are thankful. Today, when you eat the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, know. Know in that moment, the tasting, the drinking, how profoundly God loves you. And that God's story includes forever forgiveness. All sin wiped clean. All because the word was him. And through him, all was made. Including you and I. As John will say these famous words. For our Lord gave us, our God gave us his one and only son. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Have those words on your heart today. And if those words are on your heart, how can you not add this one? Thank you. What will you write? How will your 2016 journey begin? Amen.